Well, hello again, and welcome to Greenbrier Valley Church of the Nazarene Sunday School on Saturday. Uh, we are continuing our study in the uh, Boundary Publication, The Faith Connection. We are on session 11, and we are still in the book of Psalm, and today we'll be taking a look at the first 12 verses in Psalm 51. But before we get into that, let's go ahead and open up with a quick word of prayer and lift up your hearts to God for anything that you need help with because he is our source of help. He is our only true source of health. Help. And we have all seen how he has worked in our lives and the lives of others. And he can do that again and again and again unceasingly so let's pray father we thank you and we worship you and we praise you because you are everlasting you are everywhere you are our source of help our source of hope our source of joy and you are love and we thank you, Lord, for all that you do in our lives, in the lives of our friends and families and neighbors, and throughout the world, Lord, because it is only from you that true healing comes, that true joy comes, true peace comes. And Lord, in this day, we need that. The world is in an uproar. We just pray for the leaders of our country, the leaders around the world, that they would come to know you better and to rely on you as they govern. Heal our land, Lord. Heal all those who are ill, who are sick, especially those who have come down with the COVID virus and be with those families who have lost loved ones because only you can give them true comfort we praise your name lord we love you and we pray in the name of your son and our savior jesus christ amen as i said we're looking at psalm 51 the first 12 verses and this psalm is written by David, and it describes King David's broken relationship with God after David sinned with Bathsheba and had her husband killed. Now, David is a perfect example of a sinful human. Here is someone who is described after a, a man after God's own heart and he has committed murder and adultery. But yet, as we read this, we find that God has forgiven David. And David continues to walk in his grace. David sought to repair his broken relationship with God. That's why he could continue to walk in company with God. Because he confessed his sin. He repented. And he asked God to make him new, repairing the, the breach and creating in him a new heart. Now, this psalm is one of, well, it is the psalm that is used the most as a prayer in Christian worship around the world. And there's one verse I know you will definitely recognize. So let's open up with reading the first 12 verses of Psalm 51. And today's title is A Prayer of Confession. And when we confess and repent of our sins, God forgives us out of his unfailing love and mercy. So David begins in, in verse 1. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. 
According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgression, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your present or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. This is the word of the Lord. One asks for mercy in only one position. Complete dependency on someone superior or stronger. Imagine a combatant who's been wrestled to the ground and is being held at knife point. Or a student who has failed a test and goes to see the teacher about future prospects in the course. The psalmist was in such, complete, in such a place of complete dependency on God and so prayed, have mercy on me. And David's prayer begins with a cry of mercy to the God who is both powerful enough to forgive and cleanse and compassionate enough to actually do it. Now, how is David's cry for mercy different from the pride that prompted the sin? If you remember the story, David was on the, the roof of his palace and he looked out and he saw a beautiful woman naked bathing. It was Bathsheba and he was the king. He could have anybody he wanted. And he even used a military operation to have her husband murdered. Now, why is acknowledgement of our sin and God as a creator and redeemer important to our reconcilia reconciliation with God? Well, we have to repent of our sins. We have to announce it. We have, I have sinned, God. And here's what it is. That's what we're required to do to receive repentance. Now, forgiveness is what David is asking for. The gift of forgiveness, a merciful response from a faithful God, is expressed in three vigorous verbs. Blot out. Now, that kind of has a picture of your sin is written in a book, and now you're asking God, to take it out of the book, to blot it out, to erase it, to wash away. That is something along the lines of washing clothes vigorously to get a stain out of them and to cleanse. This is, we can see this in the Bible when, before they go into worship, they have to ritually wash or cleanse themselves. And David's asking for all three. The three 
verbs that we just talked about are matched with three different words for what one is forgiven of. Transgressions. And that means to disobey. Iniquity, to stray. And sin is to miss the mark. So how does God cleanse us from his sins, from our sins? Let's look at uh, verses 3 and 4 now. The psalmist, or David's confession, was deeply felt and understood experimentally. It was not generic or abstract. He says, I know, and it's before me. David is being convicted here. Remember, David is one of the people in the Old Testament who received the Holy Spirit before Pentecost, and, and it was spread throughout the world. God's Spirit was on David, and he was being convicted. He says, I know, it's before me. And he is recognizing or admitting personal ownership of this sin. It was me. You know, many times we uh, have a tendency to blame others for our faults, for our mistakes, and even our sins. But God knows better. We have to take ownership we have to admit, yes, that was me. And it was wrong. And it says, against you. David admits, I sinned only against you. Now, even though sin has a wide-ranging effect, it affects the sinner. And in it also affects the person or people that the sin was committed against. Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, was killed. He was definitely impacted, was he not? And Bathsheba was impacted from David's sin. And eventually they went on and had a baby, but the baby died. Even that baby was impacted by David's sin. But yet, sin is primarily against God. God is holy. He's pure. He cannot stand sin. So when we sin, it is primarily against God, even though it will impact others. And, in your, and he talks about in your sight. God knows what happened. And he acknowledged the impact of sin on one's relationship for God. And like I said, it impacted David. He was feeling convicted. It impacted Bathsheba, Uriah, the baby, and maybe even others. Excuse me. It was the Spirit of God speaking through the prophet Nathan. Nathan came forward and accused David of sinning against God. And David recognized this. And this led to this confession and, and asking for forgiveness. So what did it mean for David and what does it mean for us to take ownership of our sin? God knows. If we go to God and say, hey, forgive me, but somebody else made me do it, then we are not being truthful with God. We are not taking ownership and God knows that.
But if we look at verse 6, there's a little bit of hope here because David says, you taught me wisdom while in the womb. Something that many, many people point out, even people who in some far off place in, in the world that maybe has, have not heard of the Bible, or have not heard of God, yet they have an innate feeling of right and wrong. And David is kind of pointing to that. You gave me wisdom while in the womb. David knew right from wrong, and he knew it from the very beginning because God planted that in him. God plants it in us. Now, let's look at verses 7 through 9. Continuing the themes in verse 1 and 2, he used the image of the hyssop bush which was associated with various cleaning rituals. And you can find these rituals in Exodus and for the Passover, uh, Leviticus for leprosy, Numbers for coming in contact with corpses or dead bodies. The, imaging, uh, the imagery of washing is repeated, but here the reference is to snow and its positive association with the color white. There's, there are several times we read in the Bible that we can be that when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior and the Holy Spirit comes upon us and you know we start walking with we are pure as the driven snow in God's eyes because He has forgiven us and it's mentioned here to be whiter than snow was to be prepared for the presence of God. You know, we hear the images many times with, with visions of God in heaven and, and, you know, revelations. Everybody is dressed in white, gleaming white. And this is an example of how pure it is to be in the presence of God. And there's a new image in this prayer of forgiveness, is the hiding or turning of God's face. This was a twist on the more common image of God's face expressing displeasure or the withdrawal of favor. By contrast, David asked God to graciously separate himself from the sin. And so let's continue on. David asked God to do something for him that he could not do for himself. If God cleaned him, he would be truly clean and able to rejoice again. Now, can we try to work out our own salvation? Well, the obvious, the answer to that is obvious, no. We cannot provide our own salvation. That only comes from God. Why, what do you think David meant when he prayed, hear joy and gladness and let the bones you have crushed rejoice? One thing about that, it may be being convicted. He was not joyful. He was not happy. He did not have peace that he had before he had this sin. And so, as part of his confession, he's saying, let me come back to the right relationship with you. Let me come back to the joy and the peace and the love that you provide. And how does God blot out our sin? Well, we read in several places throughout the Bible 
God not only forgives the sin when we repent, but he forgets it. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could forget our sins? Even though God has forgiven us, we sometimes still remember them. Let's finish up with the last two verses here, verses 10 through 12. The goal of confession is more than just being forgiven, significant though that it is. Beyond forgiveness is healing and restoration. David was convicted. He was sad. He was, he felt defeated. Satan had him in his grasp. And David felt this. So forgiveness is important, but also to restore our relationship and to heal. He prays to once again experience joy and gladness and that the crushed bones of a sick and distressed body might rejoice. Now this wasn't literally his bones were crushed, but it's an indication of he felt pain, he felt weakness. And that his heart and spirit would be rejuvenated with energy, creativity, and a steadfast inner disposition. Now, this restoration was dependent on the presence of God through the Holy Spirit. Mercy that he asked for in verse 1. And so David didn't want to be exiled from his source, as was Cain in Genesis when he killed Abel or Saul, and this is something that David experienced firsthand. He saw that when Saul disobeyed God, and God removed his support for Saul, what went on in, in, in the life of Saul? Saul tried to kill David many times. David saw this firsthand, and he is... <clears throat> Pleading, don't do that to me. Don't withdraw your spirit from me. And it had been because of this sin. It had been. But David is asking, hey, don't, please restore me. He wanted to partake of the holiness of God. A holy life was characterized and is characterized now by joy and a willing spirit. And as David and we can cooperate with the Spirit of God. What would life be like outside the Spirit? of God's, or outside the presence of God. On the other side, what does it look like to be in the constant presence of God, walking with the Spirit? You know, over and over we hear and we read that true joy comes from God. True peace comes from God. True love only comes from God. People will let us down. People will hurt us. God never will. God will never abandon us. He will never hurt us. And he will never forsake us. If we confess, he will forgive our sins. And he will forget. I want to add one more verse to this. Verse 13. And I want to add this because I think it's an important lesson for us for today and something that 
we need to remind ourselves of. After David has gone through his confession, his, his asking for forgiveness, his asking for restoration and healing, here's what he says in verse 13. Then I will teach trans, transgressors your ways, and sinners will turn back to you. What David is saying here is, this is my testimony. I will use my testimony to bring people to you. I will tell sinners about how I have sinned and how God has forgiven me. And I will tell them that they need to repent and to ask God's forgiveness and walk in His Spirit. We can teach many lessons. We can preach many sermons. But there is only one thing that you can tell somebody that nobody can dispute. Nobody can contradict. And that is your testimony, your story, how God has worked in your life, what it was like before, and what it's like now. And that's what David is saying he will do. I will go out and tell people how you have forgiven me and how you have restored me. And that's what we're all called to do. The Great Commission, go and make disciples in the nations. Christ didn't say if you want to, when you have time, if you feel like it. One short word, two letters, go. And the most effective way of doing that is sharing our testimony with others. Let us pray. Father, we acknowledge our sins before you. And we are so thankful, Lord, that you can and will forgive and that you are compassionate enough to continue to love us even though we have fallen short. We praise your name, God, because not only will you forgive, but you will forget our transgressions. You will restore us to the wonderful life that is walking with you, not being put out of your presence but become closer to you. And Lord, we just praise your name to the entire world. And we just ask, Lord, that you help us, that you guide us as we go out and we make disciples in the nations. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, that it is through him that our sins are forgiven, that it is through him that we can come to you, and it is through him that we have everlasting life. We praise your name, Lord. We worship you, and we love you, and we thank you to no end for your grace and your love. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Have a wonderful rest of the weekend, and we will see you next week.